Right then, start another Amarok vlog. Now, Danny's already told me this one's going to be a little bit boring, so I'm hoping it takes a bit of a turn later on. But it's part of the process, so I think it needs to be um, included in this. So I think we've got... Oh, oh no, keys are... 502 miles we've done now. So I think that's about 70 more than the last video. So what we've been doing over the last few days is sorting the gearbox tune out and um, <clears throat> we've managed to make a little bit of headway with that. It's not quite where we want it to be, but what we have done, we've found the launch control function. I've not tested it myself, but I've been told it works. And that's um, sport, traction off, and then you have to put the gearbox into off-road or something like that. I can't bloody remember what it is, but yeah, off-road. So when we're out on road test, We'll have a look at that, but that's not why we've done this. While we're tuning the gearbox, obviously all we're doing is up and down the bypass, doing a lot of full throttle stuff. And I mentioned previously that the DPF were getting quite blocked up, which it were already quite blocked up anyway when it came to us, but even though it only done 200 miles or whatever, but it got, when we did the run, we are of a, a bar, a back pressure in the exhaust, which is quite a lot, bearing in mind like a normal non-DPF exhaust will have like, a couple hundred millibar in it if it's all right. So what we what I decided to do, obviously it weren't gonna help us. The next step, we're gonna be doing an 60 run with a gearbox before and after. We're gonna put it back to standard, run it, and then put the gearbox tune on. But that were pointless because the DPF were blocked. And what I did think were a good idea was to put it back on the dyno while the DPF were blocked and see what difference that actually made. Because obviously, if you watched the previous video, you'd have seen that there were quite an increase since the last time it had been on the dyno, but it had done a few hundred miles since. So this was a good time to do a test. So anyway, we'll look at the graphs and we'll see. So the 276 is what it did when it had done, I think about 300 miles or something like that on the dyno with this exact same tune on. Then the last time we got it in, we ended up with 296 or something like that, but that, that's irrelevant. That's not gonna really um, help this comparison. So then the 292 that you can see, the green lines, that is with the DPF blocked up a little bit. The 303 is with the DPF regen and it's still getting about six, 700 millibar of back pressure. So what that's done, we've come up with a plan this morning and then we've seen this again and we've changed the plan again. The next step for this is gonna be just to try a DPF delete pipe. Obviously, we're not going to be driving it on the road. We're just going to put it on the dyno and see what difference it makes, just so people can see what it's doing. And obviously, it's been a bit of a pain, it sort of blocking up, but it's, it's not unexpected because literally all we're doing is full throttle stuff. So if people are wanting to keep a DPF in, you need to bear in mind if it's a little bit experimental, you'll be regening it quite a lot. And it gets stinking mad at when it does. I ought to get laser thermometer and see how hot everything gets because it's noticeably hot just walking past. But anyway, so the difference you can see here, if we, I'll just, I'll just remove that one, the block DPF one. If we look at the 303 and the 276, literally the only difference between them two runs, because the DPF weren't blocked at this point, it had been regened, literally the only difference in that is more mileage on the car. So, we are in the position where if we're going to keep doing loads and loads of stuff, we might end up making a little bit more power. I think we've probably topped out at what this is going to do with standard turbo. I can't see how it can get more power. But I'll put the DPF delete on now and, and see what it does. And then I think it's probably the time to then go out. Cause the weather's absolutely terrible at the minute. <laughs> then we'll potentially try and do some not 60 stuff and see what difference it makes, but I don't like really driving things on the road with you. DPF delete, so it's probably not a good idea. We'll see what we end up doing anyway. I'll stop thinking while I'm vlogging and just talk instead. So it's making a decent difference pretty miles, and there are a few people in the comment section said, yeah, I've got one, I do a lot of towing, and I know it was better after it had done 10, 15, 20,000 miles or whatever. I can't imagine we are hard we've been working this, that it's gonna get much better but it'd have been nice, really, if we'd have fought on and we'd have thought it made as much difference to put some sort of uh, 
cylinder pressure monitoring on there and maybe a flow meter on the uh, on the blow on the crankcase vent and see how much we're actually kicking through because that in theory should tell you whether it's bedded in or not but anyway and we have got a video coming and are we bedding a brand new engine when Steph's cad is done because that's not far off as well so anyway the next video we're going to be doing something on this I think I might just take it on the road hopefully if the weather's good tomorrow I'll take it on the road and do the 0 60 stuff if not we'll do the DPF and we'll get it back on the dyno so stay tuned so we're back out in the Amarok got 503 miles on the clock so carrying on from the last bit in the dyno obviously we've seen what difference the DPF being regened and being sort of I don't say blocked but plugged up a little bit we've seen what that difference is so we did have some absolute on Facebook talking rubbish and saying uh, oh clearly a percentage tuners that's why your DPS getting blocked when you've done two tank fulls of diesel in 250 miles because basically all you're doing is running it on dyno and uh, driving it fairly hard not just cruising up and down motorway like most people are doing the first few hundred miles it's going to use more fuel it's going to block the DPF up quicker so it's not just doing percentage changes and stuff like that but anyway so since the DPF were all unblocked and everything, I've not done, and we've put a few more miles on and it seems to be getting a bit stronger, so now we're just over 300 horsepower, I've not done any pulls, so we'll get set up and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. So we need sport, off-road, traction control off. So we got 6.1 to 60, which is a fair improvement. Wait for end and we'll put a little table at all the times that we've got there. So the other thing that we need to check is what it'll do with the gearbox tune. Now I'm not expecting miracles, because if you watch the video of the launch there, we got, um, we've managed to get it to the proper launch control function. So. It's revving up to like two and a half grand. I don't think at this point with this turbo we need to lift that up, but we can see um, when we get the bigger turbos on there, we'll see if that needs to be uh, be raised or whatever. So we'll go back to the workshop and we'll see if we can um, put the gearbox tune on there, see what difference it makes. So we've flashed the gearbox tune, it took all of exactly one minute to flash which is uh, pretty quick it'd be nice if it only took that long to make the tune because we've spent an absolute age playing about with it we did buy a filing from somebody who said that they'd done one of these before and got it to behave and blah -de blah and we put it on and it made absolutely no difference to anything at all so that were a waste of money and it's one of those usual you can't get money back things but anyway so we've probably spent a week faffing about with this gearbox tune, trying to make it behave and do what we need it to do, and obviously get rid of the limits that are going to cause us problems when we uh, start pushing it a bit harder. Because obviously, once you get past them limits, you're going to start having transmission intervention, stuff like that, and we don't want that. So it's not just purely about how fast it changes gear and stuff like that. It's quite a lot of quite a lot of calibrating and quite a lot of messing about there's slopes between gears and loads of rubbish like that so it can take quite a while to do so in drive it's not really doing out any different I'll try and uh, get a little tickle crazy how quick this changes gear anyway or how many gears it's got to change we'll see what it does in drive so it's a good idea kicks down a bit. So in drive we're still changing up at four grand. So in sport there you go. 
main sport we're changing up at uh, like 47 ish which it's not the same in every gear because you've got to specify your speed and then you've got your transmit you've got your torque um, converter slippage and stuff like that but feels like it changed gear a fair bit quicker definitely bangs down harder in the uh, sport anyway I'm not sure if in manual we managed to get rid of our top shift I don't think we did no. still changes gear at about 4800 which that is something we're working on but I believe uh, speaking to Mike the tuner if it were right what he was saying that he'd not got around to testing yet that the auto upshift's not like on the old DSGs where you can just turn it off by putting it to an RPM or a speed that it can never reach in that gear. It's um, hidden away somewhere, probably in EEPROM or something like that, but we'll see anyway. We're getting a bit too deep and a bit too technical, so we just need to see if it's any faster. Not sure it's going to be, but we'll, uh, we'll get the numbers crunched and we'll see what it does. So we managed six seconds to 60, dead, which is uh, pretty good really. That's um, a fair improvement of a stock anyway. Very happy with that. The, uh, the launch control with the gearbox tune is a little bit higher, about 2200 before, it's about 26, 2700 now. I think it could probably go a little bit more, but we'll leave it. We'll leave it at that. So we've done enough testing for now. We'll um, the next test we're going to do. Get this back on the dyno. Well, get the DPF removed. Get it back on the dyno. See if it makes any difference to power, which I think it should do with 700 millibar of back pressure. But, yeah, there's, a, there's still quite a lot of stuff to do on this car. What I did want to do, I put the 2263 turbo on first. This is a 2060, GTD 2060. But that's not going to be with us for another couple of weeks because we'd all only originally planned to just go straight to a um, GTD 28s, 72. But we... Uh, sort of thought most people are probably going to want just the standardish bolt in slight upgrade probably with the DPF removal and then keep the rest of the stuff standard but one thing that is worth noting the oil temps on this will get to 120 just doing a little squirt on the, on the road so god knows what it'll do when you're going absolutely crazy, you know the guy we were talking to him yesterday again from Australia, and he's he's sat at 140 degree oil temps all the time when he's towing. But he did say he was towing a boat. I can't remember what island it's called. Daniel put a picture of it up. Towing a boat for four hours at full throttle um, through sand in fourth gear. So really, I don't know what that'd be. Full throttle, fourth gear. It might only be. 40 mile an hour, something like that. So not much airflow around there, and it's going to be 30, 40 degrees, I imagine. And the the, the engine oil temps were getting hot, but the gearbox that were only sat at 88 degrees all the time. So pretty, uh, pretty good, really. So I don't think we're going to mess about making a gearbox oil cooler for these. Not unless there's another business case comes forward for that. But we're going to upgrade the intercooler and the oil cooling system but it seems to want to run at 110 degrees all the time so I think uh, there might be a thermostat in there that's only opening at 110 for the cooling side of things so we might have to look deeper into that and see but definitely a decent market for parts for these so we don't want to uh, don't want to miss anything out so anyway we'll get in the workshop it's not going to happen straight away I don't think we're uh, up to his eyeballs in it but 
not sure how much more material Danny's going to be able to work with, but I think by the time we've chopped all this together, the dyno and these road tests, I think that'll be it. So we'll put the table at the end for the acceleration times. We'll have a look, we'll extrapolate the data and see what it'll do if we're going a bit faster as well. So we can do, not six is not always representative, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try and get as much information as we can out there. But that'll be it for this video. So if you want to know what this is going to be getting into it, have a look in the description. There's some links to the website and all the products that we do. And anything you need to know, ask in the comments. And if you do talk rubbish, you might start getting your name uh, publicised. But cheers. <laughs>